This is Show Up as a Leader, a show from People Forward Network, helping you maximize your positive impact on the world by becoming your best, fully authentic self. Hey, everyone. Have you ever met someone or had a conversation with someone who just gave you a little gusto underneath your step? Well, that's exactly what happened in my conversation with Eleanor Stutz. She has broken through so many barriers long before doing so was popular. And against all the odds, she defied the theme that women can't sell. And she has adopted this incredible model for herself that you'll hear about later of Believe, Become, Empower. She is a best-selling author. She has several books out there. And she really is the epitome of taking adversity and taking things that don't go our way and using them as a catalyst for post-traumatic growth. In fact, she has a quote that I think we all could live by that is our worst experiences are actually our best gifts in disguise. There are so many stories that you will go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. Did that really happen? Does that still happen today? The power of taking that and not just becoming a better version of ourselves, but how do we share that so others can learn from our experiences so that when people feel alone, when people feel like it's just them, they realize it's not. And how can we use our own challenges, our own growth to lift up others and help bring up people around us? It's just a really delightful conversation. I hope you get some inspiration and enjoy. Eleanor, I am really excited to have this conversation with you because part of why I'm so passionate about rehumanizing workplaces stems from two really crappy work experiences and what I've noticed it did to me and what I see it doing to other people. And I know that you have quite a bit of learning and takeaways that have fueled you from some really awful treatment in corporate America. So not that I want to start with the dark side, but I think it's really helpful for people to understand what actually goes on out there and why we need to do business differently. So will you share a little bit about your experience in corporate America, if you will, that fuels what you do now? I want to start with a quote that I created after thinking about all of it. Our worst experiences are actually our gifts in disguise. Keep that in mind when you're going through the worst as you view it. Initially, I had to go through six interviews to get a job to sell an unknown brand to copy or door-to-door against Xerox. Would anybody in the right mind have done all that? And then I was told, I would hire you, but I need to know somebody who knows you, and then I'll hire you. And that was the end of the sixth interview. I even had an interview with a janitor. Nevertheless, I thought I need some excitement and I invited friends over and they loved my stories. They couldn't believe everything I was going through. So when I told them the one story, the gentleman says, you're not going to believe this. Before he did the copier sales and became director, he worked for my father, mentioned my name. And that's how I got the first job. I cornered the director in saying, do you remember saying yes? Does this name ring a bell? Yes. Should I start at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock Monday morning? Which is best for you? And that was how I got my job. But the first day on the job, I had never sold anything in my life, except to my parents, of course. He said, you're just a stupid female. You're going to fail, and I'm not going to pay money to train you. It would be a waste of money. So you know how I took that? As a green light to do things my way. And what did I do? I made friends with everybody I met in the territory. And by the fourth month, I knew nothing about the copier equipment I was supposed to sell. I was the top producer because everybody enjoyed me. I was so different from everyone else. I will just say as a fellow female, this happens way more than people realize. I was just spent two days with one of our clients at Male Dominated Leadership Team. And I'm like, you don't understand the privilege that you have and that this stuff is real. And yes, women get called emotional or stupid or whatever. And it's not as much as now as it was many years ago, but it still happens. And that's not just for females or people who identify as females, right? It happens for all kinds of skin color, for your sexual preference. The list goes on and on. When we think about the lack of true diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, I sat with leaders who were like, this younger generation just doesn't get it. People just need to do it my way, or they think that 
all of this inclusivity stuff is BS. It's just really interesting how people don't see that beyond what's familiar to them, they need to pay attention to. So I just want to put that out there. But the second thing is what I love that you did is you're like, so you're going to like insult me or you're going to tell me I can't do something. I'm going to show you wrong. And I think anybody that's ever been marginalized in any way, shape or form, you can either crumble or you can use it as fuel to rise, whether it's I'm going to prove you wrong or I'm going to do this in spite of you or whatever. I think that there's such gifts and opportunities in that. And the third thing I will just say that I love about your jumping off story is that we are effective through relationships. Do we need to have technical knowledge? Do you need to know the product? Would it be helpful? Yeah. But the reality is, is that we accomplish things with other people. And so if we start with relationship building, first and foremost, if someone comes up to you and you have no relationship with them and they're asking a favor of you, sorry, I don't have time for you. If you have a relationship with someone, you might say, well, let me see how I can help because there's that mutuality there. So I love that you focus on relationships and then that was your success. And I love your jumping off quote that our worst experiences are our best gifts in disguise. So tell me about some of those worst experiences and the gifts that you got from them. Okay. I had two coming to mind immediately. So at the end of the year, obviously being the top producer, my hard-earned accounts were given to the man. And my quota tripled for the next year, knowing that there was no way in the world I could make three times the quota. So year after year, for 11 years, the same happened. I had to go find a new job. Guess what happened? Although I was the top producer, the next best thing was I became so-called expert on selling yourself on interviews. I could get any job I ever desired. So all these awful experiences led to two books, but I'll talk to that later. And then the worst experience I ever had proved my best. I finally took one day off for myself because I had family at home. I was waiting for the red light to turn and out of the blue, a young mother was talking to her children in the back seat, not paying attention. And she slammed into the rear end of my car at about 60 miles an hour. I told the doctor I could feel my brain swaying around in my head. Of course, he didn't believe me, but no doctor would touch me. I didn't realize how bad it was. Thankfully, I say, 10 years later, I was a passenger in a car and it skidded slowly into a lamppost, at which point I said, you better call an ambulance. On the stretcher waiting for admission, I had a near-death experience. Two visions came to me. The first was showing I was to become a speaker. It was something I always wanted to do. And I said, yes, that's what I want. Gold light encased my entire body. And that vision faded and a second one came up. The second vision was a report card. I had high life marks on the left. The right-hand side was completely blank entitled community service. And in the moment, I said, I will begin giving back to communities any way I may, but I'm always the salesperson. I said, I have to be able to walk out of the hospital on my own. This was all in my mind, of course. And I saw a blink of another light, which to me was a signal I'd be fine. And then that gold light over my body slowly dissipated. All kinds of miracles happened that night. I won't go into all the details. But the next morning, I was heavily medicated and told I'd have two minutes to meet the surgeon. I expected words of encouragement. Instead, I heard, Mrs. Stutz, when you wake up, most likely you'll be paralyzed. And to me, the most likely meant he didn't expect me to make it. And I shot back with every ounce of energy, using some of his words, doctor, when I wake up, I'd fully expect to be well. And he jumped backwards before cutting me open. I have the scar here to prove that I had the surgery. Four hours later, he was standing over me, said there's no rhyme or reason for what happened, but you will walk out of this hospital on your own in four days. And the entire staff came to visit me, calling me the walking miracle. It took me years to unravel everything that happened that night, but I never forgot my promise. The ability to get any job I wanted transformed to helping job seekers. I became a trainer in Silicon Valley for sales teams and a coach. But then I had another humiliating experience that I can go into if you like. Here's what's fascinating about this. And I've listened and talked to other people who've had various near-death experiences and how the clarity comes, you know, profoundly shapes your life. 
here's what's striking for me is that you've had one person after another telling you, you can't, this isn't going to work, being shot down. Like, What is it, do you think, that has helped you, like, I'm going to either prove you wrong or I'm going to get back up or I'm going to walk out of here? Like, what is that spirit, if you will, in you? It's ingrained in me. Thank you for asking. When I was four years old in kindergarten, someone threw sand in my eyes and I went home crying. And my dad was very goal-driven. I learned a lot from him. And he said, if you don't stand up for yourself, no one else will. Age four. By age five, someone else in kindergarten tried to pull something on me, and I upped the ante. I also grew up with bullies. So I had all the training I needed at home to know how to stand up, talk back, and do what's right. But the primary thing is to stick to your values and priorities and not let anybody dissuade you in the wrong way. And if they don't encourage you, you find someone who will. I actually grew up in a city where I didn't fit in and I was always referred to as stupid. I just stayed by myself. That was another bad experience, feeling I was stupid. So by age 16, I started traveling. I've now been to 35 countries. I love travel, meeting people from different cultures, eating their food, and finding out more about their history. It's so interesting because the conversations I've been having a lot with the leaders and teams we support is about those early years of our life and how our experiences, right, wrong, or different, good, bad, or anything in between, they shape us. And whether we had a happy childhood or traumatic childhood, our brains download programming and tell us the rules of the road. And sometimes it comes literally from a parent saying, hey, if you don't stand up for yourself, no one will. And sometimes it comes from observing our surroundings. And a lot of times that narrative is self-limiting or we start overcompensating for it and it has a cost. And sometimes there's pieces of it that are super helpful. And I just think it's so important for us to recognize where did this drive come from or where did this limitation come from? And if we go back to those early years, there's a lot that we can learn about ourselves. And I think so often people don't want to go back and do that work because it's unsettling or it's scary, but we have to understand what shapes us to figure out where we want to go from here. So thank you for sharing that. And I think it's part of all of our journey. So you said that there was another experience that has shaped you. I would love for you to share more about that. In Silicon Valley, I was very successful all the ways around. And then we moved. I was invited to a big conference and asked to introduce myself on stage, about 200 people. So I'm on stage, and upon announcing I'm a sales trainer, the men burst out into the rudest laughter I ever heard, and the women started shrieking, thinking I'm highly manipulative. It was really humiliating. I stepped down, but someone kindly came over and said, To establish credibility, you have to write a book. And I thought, I have nothing to lose. I had never written anything other than schoolwork before. All those awful corporate stories came to mind, all the 11 jobs. I wrote a corporate tell-all with names changed to protect the guilty. And that book, it broke all records. The first publishing house said yes. It became entitled, Nice Girls Do Get the Sale, Relationship Building That Gets Results. It quickly appeared in Time Magazine and became an international bestseller. Why? Because women around the world are having the same issues. Best for me, but worse for the population. Like you said, nothing's changed. And so what happened a couple of years ago? It was announced to be evergreen. It will never go out of print because nothing changes and people need the information about how I handle all those awful scenarios to move past and move above. Kudos on the book. I didn't realize it got all those awards, which is awesome. But it's sad that nothing has changed. But on the flip side, what comes up for me is that even if you're listening to this and you identify as male and not female or whatever, like we all have stuff where we have faced adversity and the workplaces for so many of us, are the source of a lot of that adversity, which is unfortunate. What I think we lose sight of going back to relationships matter and we work through relationships is we connect with other people via story. When we share ourselves, when we are willing to be vulnerable and we share ourselves and we share our experiences, even if I have not had the exact same experience, I can relate on a human level of what is humiliation like or 
being pissed off or being bullied or having someone tell you you can't or having someone just be really blunt and obnoxious or the list goes on and on. Like people can relate to that. And I think one of the reasons your book is so popular is, yeah, there are so many people that suffer in silence. There are so many people that are being treated poorly that didn't grow up with a narrative of you can stand up for yourself. Instead, they shrink and they get small and they don't know how to stand up for themselves or they don't have the resiliency or they go into the, it's just me, I'm just alone. And I think in the effort to have more inclusive workplaces, there are so many groups of people who are being labeled, who are being stereotyped, who are being marginalized, rather than feeling like you can show up to work and you can be accepted and you can contribute your gifts and you can be your authentic self. When you think about the tell-all in the book and the success you've had, what are some of the things that you're doing now to leverage all of that to help the clients that you serve and help workplaces learn from your adversity? I'm so glad you asked that question. I took, in my mind, community service to the next level, and again, a bad experience. We moved cross-country. I was invited to a number of business events, and every time I showed up, nobody would even say hello to me because I'm an older female. They didn't want to waste their time and figured I knew nothing. I wasn't up to date. So I decided I have nothing else to do. I'm reading about blogging, so I started a blog. And slowly but surely started to pick up attention because I'm knowledgeable about sales and relationship building. And people started to read it and then people started to contribute. So my service, the way I position it is to help younger readers advance their careers with a bit more ease. It's called the Smooth Sale Blog, S-A-L-E. But now it has expanded with contributions. I ask leaders from varying fields to contribute their success stories, how they overcame barriers. One of my taglines is breaking barriers. I ask them to share for the younger people to advance and more and more people are contributing content. And it's been wonderful. The attention has really picked up on it. And I also learn from others like SEO and the latest technologies because I'm not with it but I'm happy to share and read what they provide and people love it. That's awesome. Are there any common themes? Like what are some of the adversities that you're finding people are facing? Is there any patterns or any commonalities that are showing up that people are struggling with? It's about feeling isolated, that nobody wants me, nobody likes me. What am I going to do? Is it worth continuing? That's a common theme. I felt that also. And then just yesterday, someone posted an article on Twitter from a well-recognized magazine that said, even at a prestigious university, a professor was very harsh on a student who is of Indian descent, and he didn't like that the student was of a lower caste and was just downright nasty to him. And this is a liberal university. I was astounded. You have to take action when bad things happen, because if you sit idle, it's going to get worse. Actually, I'll tell you what happened. I was on Twitter, and I saw this white gentleman putting out the nicest tweets I ever saw. So it turned out he was trained by the military about inclusion, diversity, and equity. And then he asked me if I'd like to be on the social media committee for Inclusion Allies Coalition. And in a heartbeat, I said yes, and I've never stopped. The people are remarkable and they're all devoted to the same. I think with people feeling isolated and people feeling alone, I think that just increases, whether it's the hybrid work environment, whether it's people growing up with a phone in their hand and that's how they know how to communicate. But we definitely do see data and stats of loneliness and isolation being much higher. And then you add in the isolation that we all had during the heat of COVID. And I think it just exacerbates from there. So what I'm fascinated by is with the overcoming mentality, because I've been working with leaders, you can't ignore what's going on in our world or the challenges of mental health and just keep moving forward with business as usual. It doesn't work. You actually have to care. You don't have to become someone's counselor, but you have to care and show up in a fundamentally different way. And you have to think about work in a fundamentally different way at this point in time. It's the evolution of our world. So what are some of the things that you are seeing that is helping either leaders or helping organizations where people can build that resiliency, where people can overcome adversity? 
Well, I'm reading all the time about the importance of teamwork, and everybody has a right to give their input. When I was on a team, I had no right at all. But hopefully that gets a little better. And then you need to incorporate, it depends on the size of the company and the budget, of course, have a happy hour. Food always gets people talking. I used to bring food to my prospective clients. And then when they became clients, I take them out for lunch. That's how I developed loyalty. Your staff, your employees are your clients. They affect your bottom line. You need to strive to keep them happy, make them feel included, give them equitable salaries, and ask for their input. If you have a diverse team, then you're going to have far many more experiences at hand that can contribute to a more robust solution for what your business needs. I don't know why businesses overlook this but it's the differentiator for doing extraordinarily well. It's treat people as a human being, right? And I think that it can be uncomfortable for so many people to listen to perspectives that are different than theirs because maybe they have a narrative of, oh, I might be wrong or I'm not going to know how to handle this and I'm supposed to have all the answers or there might be conflict and I don't like conflict. What I appreciate about the work you're doing and everything you've shared is like some of our worst experiences are our best gifts in disguise. And I think when we decide to show up in this world as a courageous leader in our life, whatever that looks like, we're going to fall down. Either we're going to get pushed down or we're going to fall down. But there is no such thing as a straight line. It's going to have squiggles and detours. And I think the key is when we fall down or we get pushed down either way, it is what do we do and how do we get back up? And instead of having post-traumatic stress, how can we leverage that to have post-traumatic growth? And what I'm hearing from you is, You have been a person where all these experiences have really been your catalyst for post-traumatic growth. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And when people say you can't or no, just watch me. Yes, I can. And I tell people in sales that when you hear no, that's the first step to getting to yes. I got to the point where I joke with prospective clients. I said, no, we're not going to do business with you. So I looked him in the eye and I said, I have one last question. What's that? Is your no temporary, not for now? Do you need to get your budget in place? Or do you want me to never, ever darken your doorstep again? And he burst out laughing. Humor always works. And I did get the business. And so many people take that no as a personal rejection, like that they personally are being rejected. And I do think like sales, quite frankly, isn't for everybody. And I'm one of those people that abhor it. It takes a certain type of mentality, but I do like the no is temporary. Or can you look at it, get clear, is this a not now? Is it a forever? And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or that you suck or whatever. And I think that there's so much of that. And whether someone has a formal sales role or not, we all to some degree are in sales because we either have to sell our ideas Or we write to our colleagues or to our leader or to our customer. Like we all have a role in it. And I think people don't think about it that way. But whenever you're putting something out there, you could get a no thanks or not today or I don't have time or whatever, whether it's in your personal life or at work. And I think a lot of times we don't think about that. So I love that reframing of no, because I think that trips a lot of people up way more than we realize. Yeah. And the other point is you have to mentally put yourself in the other person's shoes. So when I was 10, I wanted to sell Girl Scout cookies and my mother said, no, it's unsafe to go door to door. Take the afternoon to consider why it's unsafe. So I did. And then at dinner, I said, remember you told me to ask you any questions about the lack of safety? And she said, yeah, what? So I said, well, if it's unsafe to do that for Girl Scout cookies, how come it's okay for you to go door to door for March of Dimes? So the next day we were out and my very first prospect was a very heavy set lady. And she said, I would love to buy from you, but I can't. The doctor told me I shouldn't eat sweets anymore. And I shook my head. I understood that, but I stood on her porch and I didn't leave. I didn't know whether I should ask the next question or not. And she finally said, do you have a question? I said, yeah, I do. Do you happen to have nieces, nephews, or grandchildren? Don't you think they'd visit more often if you had sweets? I ask questions all the time. Why? (laughs) 
I love your spirit. And I think that there is a lot that we can learn. And whether people have faced massive adversities beyond what you shared or smaller ones, I just think that you've literally had just crap thrown your way and be able to say, this isn't going to keep me down. And I think that spirit, the world is just super hard right now. And any semblance of that we can try to adopt for ourselves. Like I know that I like to work out with beach body folks and Sean T who does like insanity or whatever. And in COVID, he was having these really hard workout programs. And in the middle, he would say, you can do hard shit. So when I'm in the middle of something, I remind myself, Rosie, you can do hard fill in the blank. But sometimes having those mottos can help us. And I know you have some mottos that help you. What are the mottos you use? Because maybe they'll resonate for some of the listeners. Well, after the major experiences that I shared with you, My motto became believe, become, empower. Believe in yourself, become the person you envision, and then empower others by teaching them to do similar. So it's self, but also then giving the gifts to other people too, not just keeping it for yourself. Part of the purpose of this podcast is by having these discussions and having people share their stories, people gleam something from that and go, oh, hey, I could do that too. Like to just learn for yourself and keep it to yourself. I feel like that's such a missed opportunity. So I so appreciate that you are sharing that. So I know that you have this spirit of like, you're not keeping me down. But one of the things that I've learned is that in spite of all that, we all have some level of self-limiting story that still creeps up and gets in our way. And so what I would love if you'd be willing to share, Eleanor, is despite your resiliency, despite your success, despite your mottos, What is a self-limiting story that you still tell yourself sometimes? And when it shows up, how do you move beyond it so that you can still show up as a leader in your life? I'll announce it. I am late in my career. In fact, people are shocked I'm still working. I enjoy it. It keeps my brain active. I have to tell you, among retired people who've been retired a long time, the conversations are so limited. It's unbelievable. Keep working. Keep reading stuff on the internet. The other thing is I thought, oh my God, how am I ever going to keep up with the news of AI and chatbots and all of that? And then suddenly I started laughing. I use Grammarly software to ensure that what the content I put out is written properly. And it even rearranges some of my sentences in a paragraph. So I'm already using a little bit of it. It's baby step by baby step. You can do anything. Even it seems extremely challenging. I have zero technological capability. I'm a creative. But if I just cut things into tiny pieces, I can adapt. Breaking stuff down. That's awesome. All right. Are you ready for quick questions? Fill in the blank. Living authentically is? What your heart and mind tells you. Fair enough. When the world is presenting an opening, but you don't feel like showing up as a leader, what do you do? My saying is we only have one life to live and our duty is to live it without regret. Will you have regret if you don't take the opportunity? Daniel Pink did a whole book about like regret recently. So I love that. What is something people would be surprised to know about you? I'm nicer than you think, even though I'm very stubborn. I'm feisty and stubborn, but I'm nice. I love it. (laughs) All right. What is your favorite go-to movie? couple lines come to mind. We were just talking about Julia Roberts because the music Pretty Girl was playing. And then there's one line that said, are you feeling lucky, punk? That always comes to mind when you're about to do something, you're not sure it's going to work out. Are you feeling lucky? Clint Eastwood. Okay. What is your go-to song? It's more a spiritual one, but I saw the light when I was on that stretcher. Brilliant gold light. And in your heart, keep the light in your heart and in your mind and know you can do it. I'm not familiar with that one, so I'm going to go look that up. What is something you can't live without? My family. They mean everything to me. What is something in your ordinary daily life that makes your heart happy? I enjoy cooking and playing music at the same time. What do you cook? What's your go-to dish? Oh, can I tell you a funny story? Sure. Oh, okay. Years ago, my husband worked for an Asian fellow, and he thought he'd be funny. For a wedding gift, he gave us a traditional Chinese walk. And of course, I didn't even know what it was. But lo and behold, a community college was giving Chinese cooking lessons, and then we went to a grand buffet. It was elegant. 
And I invited he and his wife over for dinner. And he said the worst words possible. He turned to his wife and he said, Eleanor cooks Chinese food better than you do. I was so embarrassed. You fire up the wok and you cook some good Chinese food. I like it. I do all kinds. I mean, just everything. And then I combine cuisines. I just love cooking. It's the creativity. And what are you grateful for right now? My husband actually rescued me. As I mentioned, I didn't belong in the town we were in. And we were a blind date. And first words before he came into my apartment, he said, I need you to know I hate this city. And then he said he worked for an airline and that was my passion, travel. He came home one night. I was an entrepreneur. I had to help earn money to get the kids through college. And he came home one night. I'm typing and he's at my back and I hear him say, I know what you should do for a living. You have the personality of a salesperson. I was astounded. I got up, looked him in the eye, and I asked, is that a compliment or an insult? Your husband gave you the nudge for sales. Got it. Love it. He knows me well. It's good to have people who know us well and give us the nudges that we don't see for ourselves. I have one closing question for you, Eleanor. If you could challenge leaders everywhere to practice this one behavior that would create more human workplaces and equip everyone to show up as a leader, what would that be? Share your best. Share your painful stories, how you overcame them. Strive to help younger people or people your age to do better and to encourage teamwork, inclusion, diversity, fair pay, all the ways around so that people do feel they're in a psychologically in a safe place where their experiences are desired. Pie in the sky, I know. I love pie in the sky. I love that. Eleanor, thank you for so generously sharing your experiences and stories to help others hopefully see something that, that they can overcome. I know I've taken a lot from this and I very much am appreciative. It was wonderful talking with you, Rosie. It was fun on top of it. And if you want to contribute content, I will send you the information. Sounds good. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. To learn more, head over to peopleforwardnetwork.com and, of course, hit that follow button.